I'm going to take you through some steps that kind of summarize what to do with the crazy makers in your life. And I'm calling this message, Keeping the Crazy Makers from Making You Crazy. And before we look at those steps, I want to just pause and review what is a crazy maker. Now, I could give you a list of 100 different kinds of, of people, but let me give you six of the most common. So pull out a pencil and write these down. And as I write them down, don't look at them, okay? Don't embarrass them. But uh, these are different people that we have that we have to work with, we have to live with, we have in our neighborhoods, in our communities, soccer games and, and church everywhere. And, uh, and how do we deal with these different kinds of people? Let's look at them. Uh, number one is what I call demanding. Demanding crazy makers. These are the little dictators of life. The little Napoleons, the little Saddams. They're, they're bossy, they're pushy, they're controlling in every area. Uh, they're, they're intimidating, they dominate every conversation, they turn every conversation into a, into a power struggle, they make unrealistic demands on your life, on your time, on your schedule, and they just push, push, push. They are demanding, and it drives you crazy. The second kind is what I call disapproving. Disapproving crazy makers. And these are what I call the nitpickers. And they are picky, 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 picky. They are highly critical. Your best is never good enough. They always want more. They tend to be negative. They tend to be judgmental. They are unpleasable. They're perfectionist. And uh, they love to point out your mistakes. And the disapproving crazy makers, no matter what you do, it's just not good enough. The third kind of uh, crazy makers are what I call deafening deafening crazy makers. I call these people the megaphones of life. And they're loud and they like to talk and they like to talk at a loud, uh, uh, often 120 decibels. If you get a megaphone uh, uh, on, on, on the phone, you're not gonna get off for at least 15 minutes because they just keep talking and talking and they talk you into surrender. Number four, are the destructive crazy makers, the destructive crazy makers. And these are the people who have uncontrolled anger and I call them the volcanoes. They blow up and they explode and when they do it leaves scorching hot lava burning everything in the path. If you have a volcano in your life, you tend to walk on eggshells part of the time. Uh, the family can live in fear of when the next blow up's gonna be. There's a lot of tension and the burn casualties are quite high the destructive crazy makers, the volcanoes. Number five, uh, I call these people the discontented. Discontented crazy makers get their feelings hurt very, very easily. They're chronic complainers, they've got a martyr complex, and they get their attention by whining. And when they whine, they kind of get that nasally sound of whining all the time, and it just grates on you like your fingernails on a blackboard. These are the crybabies, the discontented crazy makers. They are never happy. And then number six, a sixth kind, uh, common crazy maker, or what I call demeaning. Demeaning crazy makers. And these people are the smart mouths. And the smart mouths are the ones who are always running off at the mouth, and they're rude, and they're insulting, and they use caustic language, and maybe they cuss. But more than just cussing and complaining and caustic language, they're bubble bursters. They like to bust your bubble, they like to tear your dream down. They love to deflate you, they love to tear you down. They get particular joy in telling you how you don't measure up. And they can be disrespectful, and they can be petty, and they can be mean. And these are the smart mouths. And by the way, uh, people who are rude all the time, uh, they're rude because they have enormous insecurities. The more insecure a person is, the more rude they tend to be. Now what I wanna do uh, this weekend is I wanna take you through a summary of verses of what the Bible says about how do you deal with these kind of people in your life. And I'm gonna give you six steps. Number one, the first thing you need to do with a crazy maker is this, refuse to be offended. I refuse to be offended. And what I mean by that is I don't take it personally. As much as you can, try not to be offended by other people. 
In other words, if you, if you wanted to, you could have such a thin skin, everything everybody does offends you. And you're gonna be unhappy most of your life. So you've gotta learn that emotional and spiritual maturity is largely determined by how you treat those who mistreat you. Let me say that again. How mature you are, emotionally and spiritually, is largely revealed in how I respond, how I treat those who mistreat me, and how I treat those who misunderstand me. Do I do tit for tat? Do I get even? If they hit me, I hit them back. If they hurt me, I hurt them back. If they insult me, I insult them back. If they get angry at me, I get angry back. Then I'm no better than they are. Emotional and spiritual maturity is determined by my reaction to the people who try to hurt me, try to, con you know, the demanding, the demeaning, the confusing, all of those people, the destructive and, and uh, disapproving people in my life. How do I handle those kind, those kind of people? One of the keys to happiness in life, it's not the only one, but one of the keys to happiness in life is you need to develop a thicker skin and just not be offended by so many things. Proverbs 12, 16, let's read it aloud together. When a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. But wise people will ignore an insult. Circle the word wise. If you're wise, you ignore an insult. If you respond to an insult with an insult, you're a fool. Why do wise people ignore an insult? Because what they do is they look behind the behavior. Now we've talked about this three different times in this series. That when you're dealing with people who are offensive, when you're dealing with people who are irritating, people who are crazy makers in your life, you need to look past the behavior to the pain. Because everything we do is motivated by something. And when people are hurting others, it's because they're hurting on the inside. Hurt people hurt people. And that they, they've got a fear, they've got an insecurity, they've got a painful past, they've got a pressure in the, in the current that maybe you don't know about. And one of the ways you can learn to not be offended by other people is to not look at their behavior. And to just look past and go, I wonder what causes them to be that way, to be that short with me. Did they get out of bed on the wrong side to have a fight with their husband or their wife today? Uh, are they going bankrupt? What's the, cause, what's the pressure, what's the thorn in their foot that's causing them to be mean to everybody else around them? And you look past the behavior and look at the pain. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 19, 11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. When you understand somebody's background, you understand their current stress, it's easier to show grace, that gives you patience, and then you overlook the offense. What I'm talking about here is real love. In fact, the Bible says refusing to be offended by other people is actually an act of mature love. It shows you how much love you've got in your heart. The more love you have in your heart, the harder it is to offend you on a personal basis. The less love, the more insecure you feel, the easier it is to offend you. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 10, 12, love overlooks the wrongs that others do. Love overlooks the wrongs that others do. The more filled I am with love, the less I'm gonna be upset with you when you are demanding or demeaning or disapproving or whatever. So this is the first step. I must choose to refuse. I choose to refuse to be offended, and I don't take it personal. I don't take it personal. Pastor Tom's gonna to come and talk about the next two steps. Number two, you don't wait for an apology before you forgive them. You don't wait for an apology to forgive them. I think many of us have got some crazy maker in our life who has done some crazy hurtful thing to us, or maybe even more importantly to somebody that we love, and in our minds we think, well, I know the Christian thing to do is to forgive, and so I will. I will forgive them as soon as they give me an apology, the right kind of apology, then I will forgive them. The problem with that is you're still holding on to the hurt. The problem with that is, in fact, the truth of it is they may never ask you 
for forgiveness. They may never say, I'm sorry, because they're a crazy maker. They don't get it. And because they don't get it, they may not even realize what they've done. And so you end up stewing over something, holding resentment over something that they've long ago forgotten. And it's eating you up inside. Never hold on to a hurt. Because resentment tears you up. Resentment, they don't even know about it. It's not hurting them, it's hurting you. Resentment is like you drinking poison, hoping it's going to kill them. It doesn't work. It never will work. So you just say, even before anything else happens, I'm going to decide right now. I'm not going to wait for this to happen or that to happen. I'm going to decide right here, right now, maybe even tonight. I'm going to forgive them. Look at this next verse in the outline, Luke 23, 34. He's hanging on the cross. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Not everyone who is a crazy maker in your life, who bugs you, who even hurts you, realizes what they're doing. Oftentimes, they're responding to their own hidden pain, and they don't know that they're hurting all these people around them. So what do you do? I remember a verse like the next one in your outline. Colossians 3.13 says, You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. That, that phrase, make allowance, is the Greek word an echo. It means to bear with, to endure, to be tolerant. Basically, it means cut people some slack. You want people to cut you some slack, you cut them some slack. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. I want God's blessing in my life, in your life. And one of the ways that you receive that is by being merciful. And it also keeps you from being torn up by resentment. So you don't wait for an apology to forgive them. Then number three, refuse to gossip about them. Proverbs 17, 9 says, disregarding other people's faults preserves love, but gossiping about them separates close friends. Now what's gossip? One definition is gossip is sharing information with somebody who's not a part of the solution or a part of the problem. They don't have nothing to do with it, but you bring them into it so you can feel better about yourself. Let's just be honest about it. Gossip, in its essence, is a form of retaliation. You're getting back at them without talking about them, talking to them, but instead you're talking about them behind their back. And it is incredibly destructive. Gossip is incredibly destructive to churches. It's incredibly destructive to families. It's incredibly destructive to businesses. It's destructive to your life. It tears you up. It separates the closest of friends. 1 Peter 3, 9 says, Do not do wrong to repay a wrong. And do not insult to repay an insult. But repay with a blessing. Because you yourselves were called to do this so that you might receive a blessing. That's the point. You can gossip and miss out on God's blessing. But instead, if you choose not to, look what happens. By choosing not to gossip, not only do you get the conversation in the right positive way in your life, but you receive God's blessing in your life. I want you to receive God's blessing in your life. And one of the ways we do that is by saying no to gossip. Step number four is I refuse to play their game. After I've done these other things, I refuse to play their game. When people try to get your attention through conflict, they're just trying to hook you. Now, this used to not be such a big deal. Uh, but now, with the internet, it's very easy to get hooked. Because you're reading along on there, and somebody makes some kind of off-the-wall statement on the internet, and you go, I'm going to tell them. And in the background, that person's thinking, got them. I just took the big one. And every bone in your body wants to fire off a quick reply to that blog, or to that email, or to that statement. And I'm telling you, don't. Don't play the game. You're just getting hooked. Proverbs 26, verse 21 says this. Just as charcoal and wood keep a fire going, a quarrelsome person keeps an argument going. How many people does it take to argue? It takes two, right? Okay. Now, if one of the people walk away, what happens to the argument? The fire goes out. The Bible says here, just as charcoal and wood keep a fire going, a quarrelsome person keeps an argument going. But if you don't join in, the fire goes out. Don't engage a quarrelsome person. Now, those of you who are business owners, you got a small business, you got one or two or three employees, or maybe you're a manager over 15 or 20 in a larger organization. 
Most people have no understanding how badly disharmony among a staff destroys productivity. Disharmony among the staff will destroy productivity faster than anything else. And so if you are an employer, you need to fire quarrelsome people quickly. It's like, get the bad apple out of the bunch quickly. Fire quarrelsome people quickly. Why? You know why? Because quarrelsome people are contagious. Troublemakers infect others. And all of a sudden, one complaining becomes two complaining, and then three complaining, and then five complaining, and then everybody's complaining. You need to fire the person quickly. The Bible says to do this over and over in many ways. You see, the rest of your team, if you're an employer, the rest of your team deserves a peaceful work environment. To not be stressed out, having one troublemaker constantly stirring everything up, causing contention, causing conflict, causing gossip, you need to owe it to them as a leader to remove that person out of the business. Proverbs 22, verse 10 says this in the Living Bible. Throw out the mocker and you'll be rid of tension, fighting, and quarrels. You wanna get the tension, the fighting, and the quarrels out of your business? Throw out the mocker, the person who's the troublemaker, the quarrelsome, the, the crazy maker who likes to argue. Number five, the fifth step in dealing with troublemaker is you refuse to cave in. Now, many believers just don't get this, what I'm about to talk about. So I'm gonna camp on this for just a minute because a lot of Christians think that the Christian way to respond to irritating or uh, uh, crazy-making people in a life is just let them have their way. In other words, just passively acquiesce. I submit. I let you have your way. I, I give in to the crazy-makers. I let them run all over me. I, I, I lay down, and I become a doormat. There's not one verse in this book the Holy Bible, that says God wants you to be a doormat. Not one verse. Now you say, but wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to forgive? Didn't we just talk about love and forgiveness? Yes, we did. But forgiveness and trust are two different things. Let's review it again. We've covered this before. Forgiveness is instant, and it is by grace. Trust is by works, and it takes time. The illustration I gave you before was if a woman's husband is beating her. He's alcoholic and in a drunken rage he beats his wife. And she kicks him out of the house. And he comes back that night and he says, will you forgive me? She has to forgive him. Yes, I do forgive you. First, God commands it. Second, she's been forgiven. Third, she's gonna need more forgiveness in the future. And fourth, she doesn't wanna have that resentment stuck in her, in her life which hurts her more than it hurts him. She has to forgive him. But he says, will you let me back in the house? Oh no, that's a different matter. Forgiveness is in instant, trust is earned. Does that make sense? The Bible teaches us not to cave in to crazy makers. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty 20 says this. You let people make slaves of you and cheat you and steal from you. Why, you even let them strut around and slap you in the face. That's the contemporary English version. Let me read the same verse in the NIV, New International. Paul says, you guys in Corinth, you even put up, he says, you just put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you. He says, you just put up with it. What are you thinking? Or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. What is Paul saying? God does not expect you to be a doormat. That is not a Christ-like thing. Paul wrote the book of Galatians for this very problem. Paul started a church in an area of Greece called Galatia. And after he left, some of these crazy making, religious crazy makers, these Judaizers, these Pharisees came in and said, oh yeah, you know everything Paul taught, that's right on about grace, but you need to add these things. You gotta keep this rule and keep this law and keep this rule and you gotta do this tradition, you gotta do this. And they loaded people down with so many do's and don'ts they were suffering and suffocating from the load of legalism. 
And Paul writes them a letter and goes, wait, what are you guys talking about? Where'd your freedom go? Jesus Christ set you free from all that junk. You're set free from the law. He said, Jesus set you free from the fear of death, and Jesus set you free from the pain of bitterness, and Jesus set you free from the guilt of your sin, but he also set you free from the expectations of others. You're not living for anybody else's plan for your life. What happened to you? Have you so quickly gone back into legalism? Here's what he says. Look at the next verse, Galatians 5.1. We have freedom now because Christ made us free. So stand strong. Do not change and go back into the slavery of the law because you've been set free. Finally, there's one more step you need to know. And this is the most difficult of all. When it comes to crazy makers, always take the high ground. Always take the high ground. You cannot control what other people say about you. You cannot control what other people do about you. You have no control over those issues. But you do have 100% control over how you respond. And that's your choice. And you can be better and respond with grace and love and kindness. And that pleases God. Romans 12, verse 14, he starts with this. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Yes, ask him to bless and not curse. Now you may be saying, Rick, I don't